Welcome back. In a moment, we'll examine solar energy. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. America has placed the online retailer Alibaba back on a blacklist for selling counterfeits. The United States trade representative said the Chinese e-commerce giant is not doing enough to curb the sales of fake items. The company has rejected the allegations. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called for a crackdown on sales of alcohol substitutes. This comes as more than 70 people in Siberia have died of methanol poisoning after drinking bath lotion. Impoverished drinkers in Russia have been known to drink perfume and cleansers as they cost far less than alcoholic drinks. One and a half tons of illegal ivory and animal parts have been seized by officials in Cambodia. The items were hidden in a shipment from Mozambique that was destined for China. This latest haul highlights Southeast Asia's prominent role in the lucrative wildlife trade. By 2050, solar power could be the world's largest source of energy. According to the International Energy Agency, more power will come from the sun than fossil fuels, wind, hydro and nuclear. While this is a huge step towards a greener planet, there's still much work to be done to find ways of storing that energy, particularly for use in buildings with their own solar panels. At the moment, solar power is mostly stored in batteries, but some don't last very long and they can contain poisonous materials, making it difficult to dispose of them safely. Insight's Chloe Culpan explains more. The past few years have seen record investments in renewable energy and it's set to continue. This is the largest solar plant in the world. It's in India, a country expecting to attract $100 billion to the renewable sector over the next five years. It's also aiming for the sun to be powering at least 60 million homes. Before us, the largest solar power plant had a single location was in California in the US. That project was of 550 megawatt, which was completed in around three years. We were looking for setting up 648 megawatt solar power plant at a single location, and that also in less than a year. Morocco is spending billions of dollars on developing this massive solar site on the edge of the Sahara Desert. Eventually, it should produce enough power for a city of around 2 million people. This was a huge, brave decision at the time when they took it. Uh, uh, 2009, 10, everybody was laughing. Uh, you know, it was a very expensive. It was a very brave decision, to be quite honest about it, where, uh, in fact, okay, the king of Morocco decided, he said, look, okay, no, my country has to move towards renewable energy and that is my that is the future uh, okay today obviously it wasn't such a silly decision it was an absolutely uh, uh, compelling uh, decision millions of dollars is also being invested in solar power in Africa where it's thought 600 million people do not have access to electricity pop star Akon is leading the charge to bring power to everyone with its project Akon lighting Africa it sees thousands of solar panels being installed in people's homes and villages the reception has been amazing. I mean, it's really no words to describe how these people are impacted by the projects. And ultimately, they, that's, that's really what motivates them to want to do more. And not, even, not only just in Africa, we can expand outside of Africa. The solar energy generated is stored using the latest lithium battery technology, which can hold about nine hours worth of power. They aren't classified as hazardous waste and can last up to 10 years, but they're more expensive to buy in the first place. We have a battery that's, that's actually set up for each house that actually stores the energy and kind of recycles it back into the grid system of um, the mini grid system that we have for all the homes. Um, but we are looking for a major storage you know, solution for the whole village in the meantime as we're moving forward. But that's been our biggest challenge really, storing the um, energy that is actually created. And that's just what scientists at London City University are researching. They believe we should be moving so they, away um, from storing solar power in so batteries, and especially ones away, made so from poisonous yeah, not, materials. Not much, but... Certainly in uh, lead-acid batteries, if they're recycled in a proper factory in the Western world, is absolutely fine, there's no problem. But quite often uh, they're used in uh, developing countries and you find children sort of picking these things apart to get the lead out and there's all the horrible chemicals. And this is quite a, quite a serious problem, uh, causing uh, toxicity and, and health issues. The team has been working on developing a flywheel which could be used to store solar energy in homes and small businesses rather than a battery. So the flywheel itself is a spinning rotor, it stores energy due to its momentum. So just like a kinetic energy storage in a vehicle. 
Some flywheel designs have failed in the past because they've broken while spinning at exceptional speed and become dangerous. And if it were to burst, it's unlikely to happen, then of course you have these huge chunks, you need very strong containment. But the design we have is, is divided into laminates, very thin stack of sheets of steel. So if one of these goes, then uh, the energy release is much less. We can put this in a steel tube and it's safe. Researchers here are hoping that in the future, nearly every house will have solar panels and they'll have something like this, a flywheel in their garage to store the energy. And the beauty of the flywheel is that it will last for at least 30 years and afterwards all the parts can be recycled. While flywheels aren't very portable and don't really work for small devices, there's clearly a need for solar energy storage on a medium scale. So while batteries will no doubt continue to be widely used for certain jobs, perhaps we'll be installing flywheels in homes over the next few years. Harry Culpin reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Roger Kemp. He's a professorial fellow in the engineering department at Lancaster University with a specialism on energy and the environment. Um, Roger, in the present practice, hydroelectric schemes often use surplus supply, don't they, to pump water up a hill and then let it down again when you need some power. Why are they not sufficient for these much bigger scales of demand? I think the big problem with pump storage is that we don't have enough hills where you can put lakes at the top of them. That the pump storage we've got in Britain is fine to, to supply perhaps 10% of our load for about three hours. But if you want something that will um, cope with the whole of the um, solar en energy output and keep that until the middle of the night, then you're going to need a lot more storage and a lot more lakes up the top of a lot of very big hills. And <laughs> okay, and it'd be very expensive to, to have that. Yeah, it'd be very expensive to go about building those. Of course it would. So we have to look at other technologies. Um, what about thermal ideas where you take some substance, a chemical or a fluid, and heat it up and then extract the heat energy from that later on? Do they work very well? Yes, I mean, they're obviously constrained by thermodynamics, so they're not going to be 100% efficient. Quite a lot of useful thermal storage comes in if you're eventually going to use the energy for heat. I mean, particularly around here in Lancaster at the moment, with outside temperatures of about 3 or 4 degrees, then there's no point in making something into electricity and then into heat and then back to electricity and then back to heat. You're better off storing the heat as low temperature heat and then using it where you want to use it. So Chloe shows the flywheel example of getting a flywheel spinning using the power when it's in plentiful supply and then you can draw power from a generator when you need it. Uh, what do you think are the prospects for that technology? I think flywheels is another of these technologies that's, that are brilliant for providing very large pulses of power over a relatively short time scale. They're, going, they're good if you've got some a, a, a supply that is steady and you want to take sudden peak loads out of it. That I don't think flywheels are going to be the answer for storing things for hours and hours and hours on end or even for, for charging up during the weekend so you can have the power during the week. I think they're, they're basically going to be fairly short-term devices. What do you think is the big answer here? I'm not sure there is one big answer. I think there's a whole lot of different answers for different types of, of problem. That here in Northern Europe, we have a very different set of problems to the ones you see in India. Electric vehicles are great. Here, we should charge them in the middle of the night when we've got plenty of wind energy. Um, and not much demand. In India, they're probably better to charge them in the middle of the day when they've got plenty of solar energy and um, they could use the surplus of that for electric vehicles. But you have to really think about this as a complete system and just to say, we'll invent this or that technology and it's now going to be the saviour of the world doesn't normally work. So no one solution here. And is it also the case that the one solution of having some kind of electricity grid might need to be broken down because the grid in itself is inefficient isn't it and if you can do localized capture and then replenishment of supply that may work quite well i think that's an urban myth that the transmission grid around britain is something like 97 96 percent efficient and in general it's far better to have your wind turbines on a hill 
some way from your city where there's plenty of wind rather than having your wind turbine in the city where there's far less wind and a bit less distance to, to take the electricity. So I think that, that a lot of people are saying, oh, we want to break this down, but actually the, the distribution grid is not as inefficient as people sometimes think. But I can see that we're dealing with different timescales here, aren't we? We might get a, if we're in a country like India, a surplus of energy, if you like, during the hot middle of the day. Uh, but if we rely as part of our energy supply on a wind component as well, we know wherever you are in the world, the wind might not blow or might not blow sufficiently to rely on that proportion of your energy needs. So how do we smooth yes. out these bumps? I think we basically need quite a lot of, of storage at different times, at different time scales. Sometimes we're going to need storage just from... Uh, daytime to nighttime or nighttime to daytime. Other times we're probably going to need storage for quite long periods. I mean, about 10 years ago in Britain we had a two week period with no wind at all. And so obviously how you deal with that is rather difficult. The other option I think we've really got to take into consideration is what's called demand response. Where rather than just saying we will always switch on our um, cooker or whatever at a particular time, you have it on a um, automatic switch on system so you switch on your these loads particularly industrial loads when you've actually got spare electricity and I think that's going to make a huge difference that would be a real change for consumers and for an industry I guess wouldn't it but that's something we're going to have to face I can see that Roger Kemp uh, Lancaster University thank you very much indeed thank you we end now with our insight bite a little something that we feel you should know China has launched a satellite into space to monitor carbon dioxide levels on Earth. The Chinese have joined Japan and the United States as the third country to track CO2 gas, the main contributor to global warming. The three-year mission will take readings every 16 days. Data collected will help evaluate whether countries are fulfilling their commitments to reducing pollutants under environmental pacts. America and China are responsible for almost 40% of the world's emissions. Any participation in curbing the level of pollutants will be welcomed by the rest of the global community. And that's all from me for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight.